Welcome back. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen me online, uh, who maybe are seeing me for the first time, I don't know. I'm Pastor Tim Redfield. I was installed a few Sundays ago. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really enjoying my ministry so far, even though it's during this uh, strange and unprecedented times, as we like to say. Just a couple of uh, reminders about our worship, since it is a uh, special uh, situation. Uh, we sent out the email giving you all the reminders about uh, the social distancing and things like that, as you can tell by the unusual arrangement of pews. Uh, we will have some special instructions later on uh, for the Lord's Supper. Um, going to be a more of a continuous flow uh, because of social distancing and everything else going on. Uh, so right before the sacrament starts, we'll talk more about that. Uh, as you exit worship tonight, um, you'll be going out the 3rd Street doors because uh, it's not as much of an issue today, but on Sunday, just kind of keeping the flow of traffic moving in one direction. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention is the wearing or not wearing of masks. Um, just feel free if that makes you comfortable uh, as you come into a setting with many different people. Uh, we as pastors, and this was something that a number of pastors in our circuit had talked about, uh, because of our facial expressions proclaiming the gospel, that was one reason we decided to not wear masks, uh, so you can see our smiles for the gospel and things like that. Uh, and so uh, also we're going to be back, of course, from you, uh, the six-foot distance and I had one other member talk about maybe someone who's hearing impaired can see our lips moving and better, um, you know, read the message that way. So that was a long opening announcement. We'll get to our first hymn of the evening, hymn number 234, verses 1 through 3. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, 
and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his command, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, was taken up in glory and intercedes for us at your right hand. Through your living and abiding word, give us hearts to know him and faith to follow where he has gone, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And please be seated. Our first lesson comes from the very beginning of the book of Acts. As we take a look at the disciples here, we see that they wanted to see the glory of Christ right then. They wanted him to fully reveal himself on earth. But that really isn't the place for that. Right now, as we live in this world, it's not the time for God's glory. It's not the time for Christ's glory. We have suffering. We endure all kinds of you know, terrible events. We look forward to the glory of heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the word of our God. 
Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Alleluia. For our second lesson, we go to 1 Peter chapters 4 and 5. If you think about the time when the apostle was writing, it was a time when the government, the Roman Empire, was persecuting the church. People were going through all kinds of suffering. Some people were even being thrown to the lions. The reason they could still have hope in spite of that persecution was, of course, because of the wonderful hope of heaven. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of our Lord. Just the thought for the children here with us tonight and for those watching on online. In a couple of moments, we'll read our gospel lesson from John, and the theme of the sermon is going to be Jesus Can't Get Any Closer. If you've ever seen a Charlie Brown Christmas or the Snoopy cartoons, you probably know this character. Anybody know his name? Adults? Pigpen. He has this cloud of dust and dirt that follows him wherever he goes, and nobody wants to get close to him. And sometimes, the last several months, maybe it's felt like nobody's wanted to get close to you. And that can make us feel kind of bad, because we like people to get close to us. We like mom and dad to give us a hug, our teachers to tell us that they, they love us and to, to show that they care for us. But tonight we're going to be reminded in our sermon that even if we feel like other people don't want to get close to us, Jesus always does. Because Jesus loves you, and he's forgiven you, and he's washed away all of your sins, and he's made you clean. So you don't have to feel like pig pen because you know Jesus, and Jesus has made you clean. We'll continue with our next hymn verse. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. How good it is to be gathered together in God's house again, around his word and sacrament, even under these different circumstances. We certainly 
thank the Lord for that, and it's so good to see your faces again and not just be preaching to that camera lens. But if I resort to that, it's what I've been used to. It's what I've gotten used to the last couple of weeks, so I apologize. Our text for this evening is from John chapter 14, our gospel lesson. When Jesus spoke the words of this text, It was in the upper room just hours before he would go out to the Garden of Gethsemane and be betrayed and handed over to his enemies. He would be leaving his disciples. Things wouldn't be the same for them. See, the Holy Spirit had created faith in the disciples' hearts. And after that, they wanted to be with Jesus wherever he went. So they followed him around for three years of his public earthly ministry, always wanting to be with Jesus. But now, he would no longer be with them. I don't know if they gave high fives in first century A.D., but Jesus would no longer be there to give his disciples high fives or to put his arm around them and walk beside them on the road. When they had doubts or questions or concerns, they couldn't go to Jesus and get the answers right away. Things were going to change. They would no longer be able to hear his gentle voice, at least not audibly, from his vocal cords upon their ears. Jesus was going to leave them. But he was not going to leave them alone. He would not leave them as orphans. In fact, Jesus wanted his followers to know that he couldn't get any closer to them. We read from John chapter 14 where Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. It's a strange thing, isn't it? It's a strange thing to keep this social distance. I remember the first time that I went to the supermarket shortly after the restrictions were put in place and everyone kind of formed a bubble around me. And it was like that cartoon. I felt like Pigpen. I must be really dirty and really dangerous because nobody is getting close to me. And perhaps Well, not perhaps. We know that they had good reason. And I had no reason to really feel bad about this because everybody was creating a bubble around everybody else. Even here at church, as we come back together and we see faces that we know and love, it's hard. It's hard to not want to shake the hand of our new pastor or to give an old friend a hug or a pat on the back, social distancing is not easy. It's hard because I think no matter how different our levels are, our levels of comfort are with wanting to touch or give people hugs, to a certain degree, We all need and crave a certain level of physical contact. Who wouldn't want to get close to Jesus? As I mentioned, his disciples certainly did. That's why they gave up their livelihood to follow him. 
after the Holy Spirit created faith in their hearts, they wanted to be close to Jesus. And so do you. That's why you're here tonight. Yes, it's good to see friends. It's good to be back in this building. But you want to meet Jesus in his word and receive him in his sacrament. You want to get close to Jesus. And even though there's that part of us that knows that our own sin, our own shortcomings should make Jesus want to keep the farthest social distance imaginable, he doesn't. He forgives us, he washes us clean, and as we heard in our text, he even brings us into himself. He comes close. In fact, he can't get any closer. But in order to do this, he had to first leave his disciples. And that wouldn't be easy for them. There was a couple of one of our sister congregations in Montana who wanted to adopt a child. And after going through the whole process, they finally found a child that was up for adoption in Africa, the Congo. So they traveled overseas, and they met this little girl, and as soon as they saw her, their hearts melted, and they knew that this was meant to be. So as soon as they could, they signed those adoption papers, and it was official. They went back to America to kind of wait for the final T's and I's to be crossed and dotted. And in that time, the Congolese government put an end to all adoptions. At least for a time, they put a freeze on it. But for three years, this couple could go back every chance that they had and visit this little girl. And they would. They'd say, you're our daughter. Welcome to our family. They'd put their arm around her and they'd love her just like she was their child. Because she was. Not only that, they found a family there in the Congo that she could live with. A family that would take care of her and treat her like she was their daughter. And every night before this little girl went to bed, that family said, your parents have left, but they're coming back. You're their little girl. They will come for you. So even though they left, they did not leave her as an orphan. And three years later, their dream became a reality. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus would leave his disciples. He would be crucified. He would rise from the dead. Then for a period of 40 days, he would appear to them. He would be with them. But then he would leave them again. And now Jesus' physical, visible presence has left us for almost 2,000 years. But he sent his Spirit. And the Spirit is not just a warm feeling or a hunch in our hearts that God is real. The Spirit is God himself, the power that lives in us, that drives us back to God's promises. The Spirit gives us the strength and the faith to believe what is revealed in Scripture. And he helps us, in fact, he makes us believe those words of God that say, to him who believes, I give the right to become children of God. Children born not of 
human descent or a husband's will, but children of God. When you are doubting who you are really are, the Spirit drives you back to your baptism and he says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. When you are feeling alone, maybe separated from other people, even a little depressed, the Spirit comes and he reminds you that Jesus has said, I may have left you, but I have not left you alone. The Spirit convinces you and he works in this holy meal that you're going to receive, no matter what type of procedure or methods we need to use, to assure you that the very body and blood of Christ is for you and in you. And you are God's dear child. Jesus could not get any closer to us. No matter how distance we, distant we might feel from others, no matter how alone and empty we may feel inside, Jesus cannot get any closer. He, spent, he sent his spirit, the counselor, the advocate, the one who lives in us. Jesus says, Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. We read this text all the time at funerals. Because, you, because I live, you also will live. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we too will rise from the dead. But I think this may even have a double meaning, that Jesus is saying, because I always live. I live in you, and the faith that you have right now lives and will never die. It's not a life that begins sometime in the future. It's a life that's already begun through the work of the Holy Spirit. Some people have predicted that maybe this terrible virus will make another surge and we'll all be quarantined again sometime. Some of you are still having to do that. And you have to watch these services online because of pre-existing health risks or other factors. And there might be times that we feel alone and socially distant. We've all had this to one degree or another. But today, Jesus reminds us that even when we can't see him, even though he has left this earth visibly, he could not get any closer. He could not get any closer because he sent his spirit into your heart. And now he even says, I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. How close do you consider the Father and the Son? I couldn't imagine a closer relationship. They're members of the divine trinity. Jesus says, just as I am in my Father, I am in you, and you are in me. I came to take away all of your sin, to make you my dear child, and not only that, but to unite you with myself. So that now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he is in you. The beautiful, mystical union of Christ and his church. Now this relationship is lived out in loving obedience. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. How does this happen? How do we keep Jesus' commands? Not because you really love him, but because he really loves you. And as he lives in you, even though we may never do that perfectly here on earth, he leads you to love his word and to strive to do what he commands. And that's how you show that you are his disciples. 
While people might continue to keep their social distance, and that's okay, today remember the person who matters most, your dear Savior, true God himself can't get any closer. Amen. We'll stand to confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. This is the time in the service where we would normally gather our offering. If you are here tonight in person, there is a basket on the way out if you'd like to leave your offering. Also, you can continue to give online or mail in or drop off your offerings here at the office as well. Uh, we thank you very much for your generosity and your, your continued support of the gospel ministry here. Please stand for prayer. For the prayer of the church this evening, we'll use a, a special prayer uh, written specially for this 2020 Memorial Day. Uh, and then we have three additional special prayers. We pray uh, with Pete and Lila Westermeyer celebrating their 58th wedding anniversary on May 26th. Uh, we pray uh, for the families of Marion Morton and Howard Shackle, Shackley. Uh, Marion Morton uh, is the mother of Marguerite Repno. Uh, went home to heaven on May 12th, and Howard Shackley is the father of Shannon Milbrath, who went home to heaven on May 16th. We pray. Almighty Father, strong to save, we pray that you would look upon America in mercy. We confess our shortcomings as a nation and our failures as a people. The fault lies not only with some who have no regard for you. We, your very own people, share the blame for thoughts and actions that violate your code of conduct. And yet, you have not abandoned us. Your word still echoes across our land. We still have the freedom to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that you continue to allow us to bask in the splendor of your word. You have visited our nation and our world with a virus that causes alarm and death. We add this to the list of reasons why we need to remember that apart from you is neither hope nor life. This is a day on which we remember loss. This is a day when we remember you as the one who restores blessings that have been lost. As we consider the long list of people who have lost their lives in defense of our country, we thank you that they have not died in vain. You have blessed their efforts to keep us as a free nation. Now bless us with your continued presence as we strive to serve you in this freedom. For the sake of your Son, bless all those who serve you by serving our country. Amen. 
Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants, Pete and Lila Westermeyer, throughout the 58 years of their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them, so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and Lord. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. Amen. O Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believers, Marion Morton and Howard Shackley, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought them to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray that you would comfort their families and all who mourn their deaths with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless bodies rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Amen. We now join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. After the words of institution, we'll have instructions as for the celebration of the sacrament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. And please be seated. So for communion tonight, an usher will direct you to come up to the table directly from your pew where you will take an individual cup that also has a wafer balancing on top of it. So hopefully you're able to do that. And then immediately walk over your, your whole family unit, if you're coming at a fa as a family unit, can come together. If you're alone, uh, just come over and stand right around the blue X. There's one on each side. So grab the cup of wine and the wafer, move over to the blue X, and then Pastor and I will say, Take and eat the body of Christ, take and drink the blood of Christ, and you will take and eat and take and drink and then return to your seats. After everyone is seated, I will say the final blessing to the entire congregation. So did you get that? If not, we will have our ushers demonstrate the first round here so that you can kind of see how the, the flow is going to go. Take and eat the body of the Lord. Take and drink the blood of the Lord. Take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, sanctify and preserve you unto life everlasting. Depart in peace, your sins are forgiven. You have heaven to look forward to. Amen. What he has done. Let all who seek the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He renews his promises and leads his people forth in joy. With shouts of thanksgiving, alleluia, alleluia. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll sing hymn 323, verses 1 and 2. Well, good evening once again. I certainly am glad that all of you could be here tonight for worship. Uh, we were talking last Monday at our meeting, talking about having church this evening and on Sunday, uh, about how maybe we had thought that our first Sunday back in worship would be a little bit different, a little bit you know, more like Easter. We're back in worship, and that's great, and I'm happy to be here, but it's definitely not like you'd have on an Easter Sunday. Uh, we have everything you know, roped off and the social distancing, but still, it did feel great to be here in the house of worship, getting to see some of you face to face. Um, being a new pastor, it's such a strange time to leave a church and get to a new church, not being able to see people like you normally would. Uh, we look forward to a you know, bigger celebration in the future, uh, but glad that you were able to make it this evening. So we want to thank uh, those who served us this evening. We thank Pastor Cloud for his message. Uh, we thank uh, Karen and Mark uh, for using their musical gifts and uh, John Risto and Rich Parkhurst uh, for helping us with, with technology. As you kind of noticed, uh, we're at a new procedure as far as worship goes with the online registration and everything else like that. Uh, so we're going to ask you to register again next week for the service you want to go to. Uh, but probably after that, we might do things a little bit differently um, just because this, it's uh, quite the number of steps to take. Uh, we don't know how long we'll be doing this uh, as far as this kind of procedure. Um, so definitely keep watching your emails uh, for more information about worship and what we're going to be doing. Like I said before, uh, we are planning to have you know, more of celebrations in the future when we can get together as a large group. Um, you know, I'm starting ministry here. We'll have a new principal uh, over at the school. Um, so it's certainly a, a wonderful time for our church. Uh, but for now, we have these, these smaller gatherings uh, even think about that, uh, I'll be looking at, you know, ways to, you know, contact you, the members, uh, perhaps now over a phone call, uh, but certainly want to get to, to meet people on a more individual basis. One thing I put out there on uh, Facebook a few weeks ago is that uh, if you could send me an email uh, with a picture of your family, uh, it'd be a way to start to get to know you. 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook. You can find me on Facebook. That's another way that I could get to know you. Uh, but it's just another way to have a contact. For me, I've always had the, you know, it's, it's much easier for me to get to know you if I meet you outside of the worship service. Because at the worship service, I'm saying hi to everybody afterwards. But it's so quick. Everybody's going by. You know, if I have something to connect you with, like your job or, um, you know, your hobbies, uh, it helps me to remember who you are. Um, like I know the Schmitz over here, uh, because I grew up in their bowling alley. Uh, I grew up in Oconomowoc, and in first grade I started bowling. Um, so it's easy for me to remember them. Uh, but yeah, if I have something outside of Sunday morning or Thursday evening worship, it helps me to remember you guys. I haven't, we didn't talk about how we might say hi to you after worship, uh, you know, like, because we have to be shaking hands is out of the question, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. Have a good night.